Good morning, church. Would you stand with me, take your Bibles, and we're going to turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1. Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 22. Let's honor the word of the Lord now as we read together. And before we do, let's pray. Lord, your word is precious. It has no rival. I thank you that your word stands alone and stands above everything else. Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear your word to us today. Holy Spirit, church, would you make this your prayer today? Holy Spirit, Give us eagerness, a zeal to receive your word, and may it have its way in our hearts and lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 22, over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse shining like awe-inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. And under the expanse their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another, and each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings, and there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse over their heads there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire And there was brightness around him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Church, this is the very word of God. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning is A Place Called Mercy. Ezekiel, he has a revelation of the Lord. He is waiting on God in the midst of difficult surroundings and circumstances. But in spite of that, he determines that he's going to seek God's face And he sees the Lord. He sees the glory of God. And it's been recorded for us now as the very word of God. There's things here that we've not seen or experienced with living creatures and and seeing these things that Ezekiel is describing, even to the point where he says it had the likeness of this and a likeness of that. Because he's trying to relate it to us who have not experienced seeing this, and there's nothing of comparison here in this world. What he's depicting for us here is the chariot throne of God. And these living creatures are are those who are carrying this throne, as it were, And there's a sound all around as they are uh, moving and as their wings are flapping, excuse me, flapping. We're told that over their heads that there was a voice in verse 25. There, There came a voice from above the expanse over their heads, and that's indicating the area above this throne which they were carrying. And then the likeness of 
one who is seated upon the throne. A likeness of a, of a man, speaking of Jesus here. And there's a voice that is speaking. It's the word of God that is coming from the throne. And when Ezekiel hears this voice and he sees the glory of the Lord, he fell on his face. It was, he was overwhelmed and his response is one of awe and worship. We see in verse 28, it was like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain. So the appearance of a rainbow. This is an aspect of what the throne of God is like. But that speaks to us of God's grace and his mercy. That even as the rainbow was placed in the sky for Noah after the flood was over and he's now on dry ground. The Lord put the bow in the sky to say that I will never again destroy the earth by means of flood. He put it there and every time we see a rainbow, it's the word of God speaking to us of his mercy it's speaking of a picture now as we see it here in Ezekiel chapter 1 of the very throne of God. Coming into chapter 2, we see that the word of the Lord then speaks to, to him. and He gives, the Spirit of God puts a word in his mouth to bring to the people. And the word that he has is one of mercy and grace. In chapter 10, still of this book, we have a picture here of the temple. Would you go ahead to chapter 10 with me for a moment? In verse 3. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the house. The house is the temple. When the man went in and a cloud filled the inner court. And the glory of the Lord, <clears throat> excuse me, went up from the cherub to the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was filled with the brightness of of the glory of the Lord. So here a, a similar picture Ezekiel is having of what he had seen back in chapter 1. Although now we're seeing that it's within the temple that's standing in Jerusalem. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. What does that sound like when God Almighty speaks, when El Shaddai proclaims whatever it is that he will proclaim? What we see pictured for us here takes us all the way back to the book of Exodus. In chapter 25, we read about the instructions that God is giving to Moses saying that I want you to build a sanctuary so that I may dwell among my people. That's in verse 8. And then verses 20 down to 22, it's speaking about aspects of the Ark of the Covenant. And on the mercy seat, also known as the atonement cover, there were to be two cherubs, so cherubim, that would be fashioned out of gold, one on either end of that cover, of that mercy seat. And the Lord said, it is there that I will meet with you. It is above the mercy seat, from between the cherub, the one who dwells between the cherubs. Hezekiah prayed that very thing in Isaiah chapter 37. O Lord of hosts, the one who dwells between the cherubim. And it was there that the Lord said that I will speak to you all the things concerning my testimony and the commands that I will give to my people. So it's speaking about the word of God, those things that I will be revealing to you about myself. And the, the, the picture that we have there then is this mercy seat, the place upon which the Lord sits. It's the throne, the Ark of the Covenant, in a sense, is symbolic of God's 
throne and the cover upon that by virtue of the blood that is placed there from the sacrifices on the day of atonement turns that seat of judgment into a seat of mercy. And here we see Ezekiel that he is overcome with the mercy of God, that God still speaks to a people who who are in exile and they are there because of their refusal to hear the voice of God. Church, if there's ever any picture of the mercy and the grace of God, it is in that. That even after they had been uh, judged in mercy, but judged nonetheless, and now they are have fallen victims to Babylon who has come and conquered them and brought them into a foreign land. And they will be there for 70 years. Nevertheless, God is still speaking to them and said, listen to my voice, listen to my word. In verse 2, or chapter 2, he says, regarding the word that he's going to put in Ezekiel's mouth, thus saith the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, they will know that a prophet has been among them. In other words, the word of God is still being proclaimed in their midst. See, God never remains silent. He's always speaking to us. And he's speaking to us through this word. Now let's look a little further to gain a greater appreciation and understanding to the impact of what Ezekiel had experienced here. We'll do so by going to the book of Psalms, chapter 89. Psalm chapter 89. When we think about mercy, the word in English is often being translated from the Hebrew as steadfast love. It could also be your mercy. But it comes from the Hebrew word chesed. Here's what we see at the very beginning. Psalm 89 and verse 1. I will sing of the steadfast love. I will sing of the mercies. I will sing of the hesed of the Lord forever. What is hesed? Well, it is mercy. It's favor. It's grace. It is steadfast love. But there's something that's, that and gives it the, the strength that it has in this meaning. It's the covenantal loyalty of God. That's really what hesed means. The covenantal loyalty. That means this, that according to God's covenant with his people, that he is loyal to that covenant, and the covenant loyalty is speaking of the stronger to the weaker, meaning that it's not that it's dependent on, upon us who are weak to fulfill it or for its outcome because there will be times that we grow weary we grow tired we become disinterested or distracted or whatever the case might be but God's covenantal loyalty his hesed is that which he will never give it up he will never turn his back it never loses its strength it never wanes or weakens in his intensity So that's what the psalmist here says from Ethan the Ezraite. Ethan, he's referred to as one of the wisest men who had ever lived. Now, not in those exact words, but if you were to look at it in 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 31, you would find in reference to Solomon who had been given wisdom from God. He was wiser even than Ethan the Ezraite and speaks about three of his other brothers that are there. So Ethan was a very wise man. And in that, he's speaking these words. And I I pray that these will be an echo of our hearts. 
I will sing of the steadfast love, the chesed, the covenantal loyalty of the Lord forever. And with my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Church, we are evidence of the faithfulness of God to all generations. Think about it for a moment. When Ethan wrote this, this is a thousand years before Jesus, so that makes it 3,000 years ago. I'm so grateful to God today that he is faithful to his covenant and he's loyal to that through all generations so that you and I are benefactors of his loyalty and of his covenant and of his faithfulness. Church, this is reason to praise his name, and we're going to unpack this even further so that we can understand and appreciate it even more. He says, For I said, steadfast love, has said, covenantal loyalty will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. We even sing this song. If, you're, if you've been around the church long enough, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, and with my mouth I will make known his faithfulness, his faithfulness. See, this is more than just words in a song, though. This needs to be a truth that we live out and that we are embraced by, not just that we would embrace, but we need to be embraced by the words of this truth because it's the, it's the place of mercy. It's really what the voice of God is all about. It's a voice of mercy, mercy being poured out, that he was going to meet with his people in the tabernacle at the place of the Ark of the Covenant representing his throne. And what Ezekiel saw in chapter 10 was, was God coming into his temple and his actual throne being depicted as being there and the actual cherubim that were represented by those gold figures upon that ark. Even to the point that the, the sound of their wings could be heard in the outer court and the voice of God speaking. And that's, that outer court speaks about the, the place of the Gentiles. So it wasn't just for the Jews, but it, it was for all the nations. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Now, we need to see that this is not speaking limited to David. This is speaking about the covenant that he made with David in light of the covenant that he had made with the son of David, Yeshua, Jesus See, that's the only reason that the covenant was made with David in the first place was because of the covenant that had already been in place with God the Son who would become, when, when this child is given unto us and, and born to us, according to Isaiah chapter 9, the Son of David, the one who is from everlasting to everlasting. And he says, so regarding this covenant... With my chosen one. This is the only begotten of the Father. I'll establish your offspring. And Isaiah 53 speaks about that. Of, of Jesus when he went to the cross and rose again from the dead. That, that his offspring as it were. His descendants speaking about his seed that would come to faith. You and me who would put our trust in him. Put our faith in him. Put our lives into his hands. But this mercy is more than, it's more than just a salvation issue. This is, this is not however many years ago I gave my life to Christ and I experienced, experienced his mercy. But church, this is a daily experiencing of his mercy. And as we have ears to hear it and eyes to see it, we recognize that his covenant is established Forever, his loyalty to his covenant is forever, O oh Lord. And so I'm going to make known your faithfulness to all generations. Continues on and 
He speaks about the heavens praising your wonders, O Lord, and your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. And it's just speaking about the majesty and the glory of God. I want us to go down a number of verses because time doesn't permit us to deal with the, all that's here. Well, time would, but I don't know if you will. Verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love has said, and faithfulness go before you. Do, do you recognize that as the Lord goes, wherever he goes, and as Ezekiel had this picture of the throne where the wheel within a wheel, that's just speaking about wheels that are intersecting. So if we could, if we could look at a, at a wheel here and then another wheel that, that's in the middle of that, intersecting at 90 degrees, it just indicates that, that this throne goes in any direction, means it's not limited in any respect. But when it says that your hesed or your covenant loyalty and faithfulness go before you, the word go before you, it's three words in English, but it's one word in the Hebrew. And the word is for the, for the word pane. It speaks, it's this face or his presence. So your covenant loyalty and your faithfulness is summed up in your presence. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound or the festal shout. So we have reason to shout. It speaks of jubilee and freedom, strength and provision. It speaks of, of being released from captivity, and we have entered into all of the goodness of God. So blessed are the people who know the, the festal shout, or perhaps your translation says uh, to who know to worship you or to acclaim you. It all takes in the same idea. Who walk, O Lord, in the light of, and the same word now, pene, who walk in the light of your presence. This is where Ezekiel found himself, in his presence. And as the Lord went before him, that he was seeing the very presence of God and he's hearing the voice of God. And, and the, even the presentation, if you will, of the throne of God with the, with the rainbow surrounding it in the expanse that was above the living creatures' heads, and the cherubim with the sounds of their wings and the voice of the Lord. It's speaking out, mercy, mercy. Verse 16, they exult in your name all day. It means they rejoice. And in your righteousness, they are exalted. When our heads are, 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 are bowed down because of heaviness or whatever it is that, that we might be feeling overwhelmed by, that when we, are, when, we, when we acknowledge the presence of God, we come to his word and we hear the voice of mercy, that place called mercy, that we'll find that in his righteousness that we become exalted. And he is the glory of our strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. Now I want you to look at verse 19. Of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one. It's this idea of, of the holy one. The, and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. Now in the natural, this can't speak of David because he was not mighty in and of himself, in his own strength. I have exalted one chosen from the people. Now, in a limited sense, this is in reference to David initially because the covenant was made with him. But ultimately, it's referring to Jesus, the one who alone is mighty and the one who alone was truly chosen from the people. In other words, the Lord God had chosen him to, from the the people of Israel and to be descended from Judah and descended further from David. And the covenant promise that God had made with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, which is outlined back in the first part of chapter 89 here that we already read, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David, my servant, I'll establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. And I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil, I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. Go down now to verse 34. 
I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. This brings us back to this word chesed, covenant loyalty. I will not violate my covenant. I am loyal to my covenants. I won't alter the word. Church, we live in a day now. If Some of you may be able to remember a day when you, a man's word or a woman's word was their bond. You would shake upon it, and that was done. It was a done deal. And you didn't go back on your word. But today there are, are lawyers even that specialize in trying to find loopholes in order to alter words of agreements that have been made so that they can get out of the contract and, and the agreement that they entered into. But I thank God today that he does not alter the word that has gone forth from his lips. He does not, cannot, and will not violate his covenants. <laughs> this, is, this is something to, to celebrate God over. Well, I want us to go back to another psalm. It's in Psalm 63. Verse 1, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, because your chesed, your covenantal loyalty, your steadfast love, your mercy is Look at this now, how he describes it, how David speaks of this chesed, the covenant of God, his mercy that he speaks to us, his favor. He says that that is better than life. In other words, my life is worthless apart from your mercy and work, your word in my life. For today, what I have in front of me right now Whatever conversations that, I, that I'm going to have later today, even in the minutes that follow the time that, that we spend as uh, looking at the word of the Lord, even the thoughts that I'm having, your steadfast love is better than life. Your mercy is, is toward us through Jesus because that mercy seat, the atonement cover, is fulfilled in Jesus, when he came and he died on the cross, shed his blood for our sins and purchased our salvation. Romans 3.25 and it speaks about that the Lord gave Jesus, God gave Jesus, his son, as a propitiation, as a mercy seat for us. And it's repeated again in in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5, when it speaks about the mercy seat, it's the same word that is used there in the Greek as is used in Romans 3 and 25. So we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the picture of that mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. So he says, so I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I lift up my hands. It's more than a song. It's more than just words on a page or words on a song. Perhaps um, you haven't recognized this before, but this is your loving kindness is better than life. So I will bless you and I'll lift up my hands in your name. I lift them up, Lord. I give glory in your name and to your name because of your great love, your steadfast love toward us, the, your favor that, if you, that you've, you have poured out upon us. And my soul, as a result, will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. Speaking of the, the best that is available of food. But when you're talking about God, it's better than any food, and it is the best not just that is av that's available in the sense that there might be some if we searched somewhere else for availability. No, this is the best that is in existence 
And there is nothing greater. It is marvelous. It is awesome. It's glorious. It's righteous and holy. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, he's speaking about in in my waking hours and my sleeping hours and even when my sleeping hours are interrupted. Whatever might be on my mind, what might have woken me up, I remember you there and I meditate on you. I meditate on your, your steadfast love. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. And he protects from those who try to destroy us. So the destroyer who's out to seek our lives, the one who's trying to to steal, kill, and destroy, we know that Jesus has come to give us life, life that is abundant, Well, I'd like us to go ahead to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I want to see this covenant. Even as we recognize that that the, the Lord God had taken Jesus... By the hand, as it were, according to Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6, he's given him to us as a covenant. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 3, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. What he's speaking about there is that through Jesus Christ, because of the covenant that had been made between the, the members of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they had established a covenant saying that, that I'm going to send you, the Father, say, I'm going to send you, Jesus, my Son, to be a covenant for these people, for all of the nations. And I will give them into your hand for everyone who will put their trust in you, who will believe in you for eternal life. So it was established before the, before the world began, before the foundation of the world. This is what that's referring to. It's referring to that covenant. And in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will and to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And the beloved here is speaking of Jesus. He has blessed us in Jesus. He speaks about the redemption that we have through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. And it, this is speaking about this voice of mercy that he's poured out upon us. He's speaking to us all the time and going on. And he shows us that he's given us a guarantee of our inheritance through the Holy Spirit. He's, he speaks here that Paul, Paul's praying that we would have our eyes opened to understand in, in verse 18 what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. That means that he is there, and the the resurrection power of the cross, that same power that was exerted by the Holy Spirit, is now at work in us who believe. Now go down to chapter 2, and I want us to see one more aspect here in Ephesians. Look at verse 4. After he's been speaking about, we have been dead in our trespasses and sins, and we gave our attention and our lives to, to the prince of the power of the air, and we were in the kingdom of darkness. But now, but now, although we were under wrath, God being rich in... Now what does your Bible say? It says in mercy, doesn't it? But the word in the Greek is the same word that you'll find in the Greek 
translation of the Old Testament. The word in the Hebrew is chesed. So God being rich in his covenantal loyalty, God being rich in his favor toward us, his being rich in his mercy, he's speaking this out to us. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And this isn't speaking in a day long ago when we knelt before the Lord and said, I worship you today, but this is a life change, that we became new creations, and that every day is a day of hearing this voice, this voice of mercy, and now we are bowed down before him as we receive this word so that we can speak the word to others and we can be an evidence of the mercy of God, a trophy of his grace, if you will, because it's uh, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And, and he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In other words, we're on display for all the world to see. And then when we come into his presence, for all the saints throughout all the ages to look around and say, glory to the, to the Lord most high. For he, look at the wonderful things that he has done in our midst. My lips will praise him and thus will I bless him. I'll lift up my hands in his name. Look, I'm here because of his mercy. You're here because of his mercy. They're here because of his mercy. Can we come back to one more chapter in Psalm 136? This, the chapter that you'll find has said in more than any other chapter in the scriptures as far as it being listed. Psalm 136. We have here the 26 verses, but I want you to notice over and over again, it's speaking about the steadfast love. It's speaking about the covenantal loyalty of our God. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his has said, his steadfast love, his covenantal loyalty endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for his proclamation of mercy to us, his favor, his has said, his covenantal loyalty endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. Church, we're bringing this in to a conclusion here. I'm going to ask, can we stand one more time as, as we read this together, as we would stand in honor and, and thankfulness in a sense of responding to the steadfast love of the Lord that endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now, I want to admonish you. I need to encourage you. Don't become disengaged here with the amount of times that it's the steadfast love endures forever because we need to get this. The, the writer here, it's not just the writer, but it's more specifically, the Holy Spirit intentionally had it recorded this way so that we can be reminded, so we can be impacted with the steadfast love of our God, that his love does endure forever. His loyalty to his covenant endures forever. And the reason why we see it so many times listed here, instead of just listing all of these various aspects, even to the point... Um, I won't, uh, even to the, to the point where he could have summarized it at the very end. For all of these things, his steadfast love endures forever. That's the way you and I would have done it. But what I think he's doing is he's punctuating each occurrence, each event, each aspect of, of 
Israel's history, which is a picture then for every aspect of our lives, day in and day out, every encounter, every interaction, every conversation, everything that comes up, it's punctuated with his steadfast love endures forever. In this, yes, too, his mercy is here in the midst of this. So let's keep reading together. To him who made great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. Would you, re, would you declare it with me, at least on that part where it stays the same? To the Son, the Son to rule over the day, and together now, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, church, you may be in need of that today. Be reminded that his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it, because his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance or as a heritage for his steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our lowest state. Oh, praise God that he has remembered us in our lowest state. It, he didn't love us because we were great or strong or mighty. He did so because he remembered his covenant that he had made, <laughs> and he's faithful to his covenant, and he will not alter it. His love, steadfast love, endures forever and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh for his steadfast love endures forever. Church, give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Bless the name of the Lord our God. That's why the psalmist said, I will, I will bless the Lord. Give thanks to him because his steadfast love endures forever. And I want to finish off with this one verse in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. The Ark of the Covenant, as it was, as it were, the presence of God who goes before us, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. That we would call upon that covenantal loyalty of the Lord our God, the favor that he has put upon us. Lord, I'm in need of you right now. We're in need of him every moment of every day. And let it be something that we recognize and acknowledge. And as a result, that we would constantly become, and I lift up my hands in your name, Lord. One more time. One more time, Lord, may I see your mercy at work in my life. May I have ears to hear your voice that is speaking out the word of mercy. I want to dwell in that place called mercy. That I would come with confidence to this throne of grace knowing that that seat upon which you sit is a seat of mercy because of the death and resurrection, the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, that your name would be lifted high. Your purpose would be accomplished in the earth through us who are called by your name, by your mercy and by your grace and the demonstration of your love that you have so lavishly poured out upon us. And we bless and praise you for your name's sake, in Jesus' name, amen.